Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Can everyone at the back hear okay? A few nods. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to get going because I'm going to try and cover as much as possible in the next 75 minutes. Um, but as the title says, I'm going to be talking about network performance blockers for your Office 365 deployments. I'm Paul Collins. I'm a senior program manager within our CXP team. I work under engineering and I, I work with our customers to unblock network issues and talk to them about connectivity models to the cloud. And in my previous guys, I was a field engineer and I developed and rolled out our network performance assessment that we delivered through Premier. And with that, I've gained a lot of experience about how our customers are connecting to our cloud services and where the problems are. So hopefully in the next 75 minutes, I'll get across as much of that as I can uh, to you. So what I want to cover is it's something we, I don't think we talk enough about, and I'm, I'm trying to work on rectifying that. Um, Microsoft has some astonishing infrastructure. Uh, we talk a lot about our data centers and where they are, and I'm going to go through that. But one thing we don't talk enough about is our network infrastructure. Um, we have an enormous network that is designed to get your traffic into our data centers. So I'm going to talk to you about that. So the more you understand about how that network is structured, the better you can connect your services into us. Um, I'll talk about the various methods available to connect out of your enterprise into, uh, into a network. And there'll be some troubleshooting elements at the end. Um, I didn't want to go too heavy on troubleshooting because I've covered this before and there's a, a link at the end of the slide deck uh, where we've got troubleshooting steps online. But I'll cover the, the most important ones. But as I say, what, to wanna, what I want to get across to you is uh, connectivity, how to best get your traffic to us. So I, I sat down and thought about what are the most common performance blockers that uh, I see when I talk to customers, when I look at their performance issues. And, and I boiled them down to pretty much these. Poor connectivity to Microsoft's network. Um, so as I say, we're going to cover how to check that and where our network points are that you can connect to. Latency, which you'd think would be included in that top one, but there are different elements of latency we need to be aware of. Uh, so I'll talk about those and where the problems might lie. Um, egress configuration or bottlenecks. This is one of the main ones where how you're getting out of your environment into the internet, express route into our services. So I'll go over some of the common problems there. Bandwidth availability is a big blocker for performance. If you don't have enough bandwidth, you're not going to be able to connect to performance speed. Um, I'm going to cover that to a slight degree, but there's a whole session on that tomorrow, which again, I've linked at the end. And client misconfiguration is another area which I'll, I'll cover at the end of the, the slide deck. So with that, I'll start talking about Microsoft's global infrastructure. Bit of a marketing slide, don't worry, we're not going to market you to death to, in the next 75 minutes. But this is where Office 365 is available. So you can purchase, purchase it in all these locations. But obviously, we don't have data centers in every one of these locations. So they're condensed down into these regions. So if you're in North America, your tenant is located in North America. If you're in any country in Europe, when you spin up your tenant, you're in the Europe region, with some exceptions, as you can see there with the UK, the new data centers. So when we have enough um, capacity or enough requirements for customers to have local data centers, and that's what we do. And we're constantly evaluating where that's necessary and adding infrastructure to do that. So we have these regions, and then within those regions, we have the data centers. So if you spin up a tenant in the US region, it's going to be in one of these locations. Uh, one of the key things to point out here, and, and this is where sometimes we get a bit of crossover between Azure and Office 365, you can't think of your data in Office 365 as being in one location. I quite often get customers say to me in Europe, OK, my tenant's in Dublin. It may well be at that point in time, but in a split second, it could be active in Amsterdam. So you've kind of got to step back and think, not that you want to connect to a point where you think your data is. What you want to concentrate on is quickly connecting to Microsoft's data centers. Um, Microsoft's network. I just contradicted myself. Um, so Canada, the data centers in these locations. South America, Europe, 
India, another new region where we've got enough demand that it warrants its own data centers. Uh, Japan, again, enough demand there. This is the APAC region, so any of those areas that don't fall under those particular countries will be hosted in these locations. And Australia, which covers New Zealand, Fiji, and Australia, obviously. And you'll notice there, there are two in China, but you can't think of those as part of Office 365. They're run completely separately, they're air-gapped from Office 365, and they're run by a company called 21 Vinet. But I just wanted to make you, make you aware that those are, are there. So, this is the thing we don't talk about a lot. Microsoft's global network. When I talk to customers, they, they, they have worries and concerns about connecting over the internet, which is a valid concern. When you go to a website, you're reliant on your ISP to get that traffic from A to B. So, to CNN.com, Microsoft.com, your ISP's in charge of getting that traffic from end to end, in most cases. Microsoft have one of the top three networks in the world in terms of traffic. We don't know where we are in that top three. Um, but it's enormous. We carry um, an enormous amount of traffic. We handle something like one and a half million network requests per second on this network. Um, and that whole network is designed to get your traffic from your clients, from your services, into Microsoft data centers and back again uh, in a performant amount of time. So all of those dots represent locations where Microsoft has peering, where we work with ISPs to grab that traffic from them and take it on our network. So that, that network is managed by a team called Azure Networking. They're formerly called uh, GNS, and I, I just point that out because I constantly refer to them as GNS. Uh, as I say, one of the top three networks in the world. It's enormous, very high bandwidth, low latency, failover capable links. Um, privately owned dark fiber to connect both our DCs to the internet and the DCs between themselves. Um, and to get your traffic to us, we work very closely with two, over 2,000 ISPs uh, globally, and we have 60 points of presence, those dots you saw on that map. Um, and once you know this network's here, and I'm going to show you a little later on how to look at how your ISP is doing with connecting with Microsoft. Um, you can then work out if that's optimal for you. So most of our router names have msn.net on the router, Microsoft Network. Um, and the aim is to get your traffic to that network as quickly as possible with as little interference as possible. Um, and when you get it on that network, we can get it to where it needs to go, wherever that may be in the world. So I went through and pinned down those locations where we peer to share with you. So you can see we have a wide spread of countries, locations. Some of those locations have multiple um, peer points. So London, for example, we have quite a few there where we peer with different ISPs in different ways. But in the US here, you have uh, 14 locations where we'll pick that traffic up from ISPs. These are internet exchanges, places like Equinix, and basically you'll have people like AT&T and Verizon and BT and Comcast have routers in these places and they hand traffic between each other. So Microsoft sits in there and we say, hey, get anything from Microsoft, give it us here and we'll take it from here. So just some notes on that. I couldn't fit them on that other slide. Um, I've already mentioned some cities have multiple points. Um, that Data is from somewhere called PeeringDB, which I'm going to give you a link to later. You can look that up yourself. And you can also look up which other ISPs are in that location. So there's the link. Uh, it's a public website. Our ASN our network number is 8075. So if you search for that, it will show you everywhere Microsoft peers. And if you click into that location, like the, there's an Atlanta one, which I'll show you the routing to in a second. Um, you can then see which other ISPs are in that same location and see if yours is there. So, we have that global network. I'll come back to that a little later on when we look at routing to show you how, uh, how we get to that network and how you can uh, analyze that yourself. But from an enterprise perspective, how do we connect to Microsoft? And again, I've sat and thought about this. There are a whole plethora of ways you can get your traffic out of your enterprise network and into us. But if you boil them down, they come down to two options. Proxied, 
So we go through a proxy or direct routing. And Express Route would fall under that, that model. Um, and we'll, there's two talks we're going to do tomorrow around Express Route. So I'm not going to concentrate on it too much. But Express Route also requires an internet uh, connection. So in that scenario, you've actually got two connectivity methods going on. So they would look roughly like this if you had all three. The client would, if you've got a proxy, the client would make a connection to a proxy, which would then make another connection out to Office 365 via the public internet. If you had a direct connection, you have a device at the edge of the network which flips the IP address to a publicly routable one and sends it on its way. But the key point to note there, both of those are going over the public internet, but only to the point where that ISP meets Microsoft's global network. It's not going end to end from your edge of your network to our data center on ISP managed networks. That's not the case. The other thing to point out here, on the bottom we have Express Route. So essentially Express Route is purely an override, a routing override of that internet route. But the Express Route circuit will terminate in the same point as your ISP will terminate that traffic. And that point becomes more important um, as a, some of the areas I'll talk about later on. So now I'm just going to walk you through those three options and talk about the pros and cons of each. Um, so each method has a, a, you know, some pros, some cons. And some customers have drivers to use one or the other. So I'll go through those. And it will help you make your decision around what's best for you to get your traffic to us. So proxy server, I probably don't need to explain what one is, but it's a device that sits at the edge of your network. It, there are many guises of this, but the most common to see would be a, a forward proxy that would sit on the edge of the network. The client's going to make a connection to the pro proxy and say, hey, I want to get to outlook.office365.com. And the proxy will make that connection on behalf of the client to the service. So this allows the proxy to intercept traffic uh, manage requests going in and out, etc. The pros of that, it's really easy to configure. It's quite often when I speak to customers, it's their de facto internet connection method. So that's what they want to use moving forward, which is fair enough. Um, another bonus is you, you're connecting to a small number of IP addresses. The client doesn't need to know how to get to all our array of IP addresses. It just needs to know, I want to get out to the internet I'll ask the proxy to do that for me. Um, in terms of routing, we're using known ports. We can just fix that traffic on port 8080 and allow it through all our internal firewalls. Another driver I see for the reuse of proxies is um, internal networks not being able to carry external IPs. Either through choice, you don't want them on that network, or through necessity, you can't handle them on that network for various reasons. And it does give you a little perception of security barrier, because that's how you've always connected to the internet. It ensures you can't get into any dodgy websites and uh, kind of gives that security team a feeling that there's something in the middle doing something for that, that traffic. The cons of that, though, proxies generally do not handle UDP traffic very well, or at all. Um, so Skype for business, if you're using Skype over that proxy, it has to switch to TCP. Now, as you probably know, real-time devices generally use UDP because if packets get lost on the way or delayed, it doesn't matter. We can kind of fill in the gaps and discard them. When you're using TCP, we have to deliver every frame that goes out to that client um, to its endpoint. So there's a high risk there, especially as the proxy is messing with the traffic. It's getting in the middle, having to send it on the second connection out then there's a high risk of performance issues if that proxy is not scaled well to do the job. And often, I see proxies that have been put in five, eight, ten years ago for users to look at cat videos or whatever they do during their working hours. Um, and we've got to think, are these going to stand up to this heavy SaaS usage? Now, if you think about Outlook, for example, it's going to open multiple TCP connections, and it's going to sit there all day with them. So is that proxy going to handle that? Because is it designed just to go, I'll get that cat video and then close the TCP session, and I can reuse that resource? That's no longer the case for a lot of TCP sessions to SaaS services. So we've either got to scale them up 
and make sure that they're not interfering with that traffic as that connection stays live. Um, often when I hear of core, core quality issues, meeting quality issues, we, we get down to it and it's a proxy in the middle. Um, and taking that out of the equation solves the problem. Uh, sometimes it's just because we're using old proxies. Other times even new proxies just aren't scaled well enough to handle that. And Skype for Business cannot perform at its best over TCP. Just to give you an example, I, this is a sanitized uh, graph from a customer I did an assessment on a while ago. We were using a proxy, which is the red line, uh, or multiple proxies, um, to download a 30 meg file from Office 365 from multiple locations in the UK to an EMEA data center. So you can see Houston there on the left, uh, which is in London, and it took 89 seconds to pull that 30 meg down, file down. So I know that's not good enough, because I, I do this all the time. I know what's good and bad. And the same story repeated on most of the, proxy, uh, the, the proxies, apart from that middle one in Leeds. So I said to the customer, this isn't right. Something's wrong here. Other network elements look fine. And he said, well, I've got a direct route. Should we just bypass the proxy and see what happens? And we did that. And the green line is your example there. That's bypassing the proxy. The reason why that middle one's better is because that used a different proxy node. So uh, that proxy was overloaded, and the one with the bad results was overloaded uh, and causing that issue. So these can be very hard problems to pin down what's causing it. Um, so just an example of how a proxy can really impact the performance. And if you think of a user, they'll really feel that difference. And if you're moving mailboxes through this proxy, you'll really feel it. So if you must use a proxy, then ensure those devices are scaled up. We, we understand we fully support Office 365 over proxies. We understand there are numerous reasons why you would want to use them. So just have a think. We're moving into the cloud world, or we've already moved there. We need to consider that those devices were maybe designed, put in for a different use. We need to, to think about that. Uh, avoid centralized proxies. I'll talk a bit later on about connectivity models, but um, by that I mean, where possible, use localized egresses. If you have a single proxy infrastructure in a US-wide um, network and sites, that's invariably going to cause performance issues because you've got to back all that traffic all the way into that egress through those proxies and then out again. If you were to have local egresses, that would probably give you better performance. I'll cover that a little later on. Um, ensure they're in the local region of the client. By that I mean, if you have a European site, uh, don't use a proxy in the US to egress the internet because you're bypassing a lot of our localization features which help with performance. Again, I'll cover some of those later on. Try not to um, do much in the way of packet inspection on these if you don't have to. Evaluate whether we're actually doing some of that security stuff you want to do in the back end or whether it's actually necessary for these trusted endpoints. You're not going to you know, unknown websites. You're going to Office 365 endpoints, which you, in, to some degree, would trust. Um, I've got a link at the end with the top 10 issues I run into. So just walk through those and make sure they're all checked and optimized. And still, Skype for Business, if you can at all help it, Proxies are not a good idea for them. Uh, one of the notes I didn't say there, actually, was sometimes customers don't want to spend money on uh, a lot of new proxy infrastructure because you know, they haven't got the team to maintain them, etc. So a, a cloud uh, proxy solution vendor uh, may be a, give you a solution there for localized egress without you having to do that management piece. And I've worked with numerous customers using um, such companies. So. Your other option would be a direct network connection. Now, this is our preferred way to connect to our services. And by this, I mean we don't terminate the TCP connection at the edge of your network. We just flip the IP address to a routable one and send it on its way. Um, that device may also contain a list to say you can only access the uh, Office 365 endpoints, which is fine. And it means we've got an end-to-end -end connection with hopefully little interference on that session on the way through. So the prone to that, Skype can work at its best. It's using UDP. If packets get lost, it's got ex extremely good handling capabilities if on a bad network when we're using UDP. 
So even if you have an intermittent problem somewhere, or your ISP does, we should hopefully be able to handle that over UDP, which wouldn't be the case with TCP over a proxy. So I said before, generally you don't get any interference on that traffic when it goes through that device. Again, by design, if you can help do that, it means that there's less chance of any performance issues. And often it's an easier way, you know, rather than paying for very expensive proxies at each, lo each location, we can just NAT that through a firewall or another device at the edge of our network locally, which again aids in getting that traffic to Microsoft's infrastructure. So the cons of that, and there are some, customers need to manage the, um, well, if you wish, if you have, I have some customers that just let everything out. Others want to control what you can connect to through that direct egress. So there's an element of work there and management to monitor Microsoft's endpoints and make sure that firewall or that, that device lets them out. Um, so it can sometimes be a challenge. If you have several hundred, I don't know, even thousands of direct egress points, managing that list on all of them can be a challenge for large organizations. And if you miss IP ranges, you're going to get intermittent connectivity issues from your clients. Um, the other issue is routing to the egress needs to be managed internally. Again, can be a challenge. You remember, if we we're using a proxy, we just fire it at an IP address, and it gets there. If we've got multiple egresses, we need to manage which egress we're going to use internally. Again, that's your network team's job to manage that, but it can be a difficult job for some companies, depending on how their network's structured. And those things need, still need to scale. Like I said before, with the proxies, they need to scale up for their new use. Same goes for these devices. So I'm going to touch on Express Route for a little bit. Again, I'll talk about the pros and cons of each, but we're going to cover this in depth in two sessions tomorrow. If you're interested in this area, then uh, I'd come along to those. So Express Route, I mentioned before, it's just a private peering. Um, it's a routing override where rather than use uh, Comcast to get from the edge of your network to that peer point of Microsoft's, you have a private network connection that does that. Now, that might not give you any better performance, but it does give you a more reliable connection in that you know you've got one gig of bandwidth, and that's reserved for your Office 365 traffic, etc. cetera. Um, most Office 365 services, but are not all, which is why we need the internet, um, will utilize that link if it's available. So the key thing to remember, and I mentioned it earlier, is that it does not connect you into the data center. It connects you to the edge of Microsoft's network, wherever that termination point may be, which is likely to be the same point as your ISP, or very near where your ISP would peer if you push that over the internet. So the pros, we give a 99.9% .9 SLA for availability. And as I mentioned, it's predictable performance because we own that link end to end. We're not sharing it with the internet. Um, quality of service can be a driver for wanting express route for Skype for business. Um, they've got guidance online about how they can handle that over express route. Um, some companies need, for regulatory reasons, a private network connection, um, i.e. they can't use the internet. So that could be another driver and, and the express route will solve that. And you can see a rather long list of cons here. Um, you still need a good internet connection because that, that doesn't go away. Because if you don't have that, that element is going to cause you performance issues. A good internet connection may well give you as good, if not better, performance, depending on how that's set up. And that is absolutely true. That network we have is designed to get that traffic to us. And if you can connect to that network over your ISP quickly, that's good for our services. Um, and one of the things I often see with ExpressRoute is it encourages a move away from that localized egress model to a centralized one. So you're backhauling traffic into a central location to go out of that ExpressRoute circuit, which again can cause performance issues rather than going local. H much higher cost of implementation, uses, and maintenance. It, you require a very highly skilled network team to implement this. Again, we'll talk about why that is tomorrow uh, in the two sessions. And there is a very, very high risk of uh, problems on cutover if you do not do what we think is probably two to six months of planning to get this circuit set up and manage the traffic flows. Again, I'll go into the details on that tomorrow. 
you still need security elements on that circuit. It doesn't bypass the need for security. Um, so in, in my opinion, the cost-benefit ratio of that needs assessing before you look at that as a, an option for Office 365 use. This does not refer to Azure uh, Express Route. That's a different story and, and is the recommended connection option. Um, can you keep it to the end? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, so just a summary on that. Um, a well-configured direct internet connection, in most cases for customers, will be your optimal method to connect to our services, both in terms of performance and cost. Um, whichever method you go through, we strongly advise a, a connectivity assessment, a network assessment, to look at what are your options, how to get to Microsoft's services and ensure that there's no bottlenecks or issues along the way. Um, as I say, Skype for Business is not a good idea over proxies. Um, and if you must use them, obviously do that work to ensure they're not causing you a bottleneck. So with that, um, I'll talk a bit more about latency and routing, because this is going to be one of your major blockers. If this isn't right, it's going to cause you a performance blocker to your services. The first thing we need to do when we're thinking about this is look at endpoints. How are we going to test this? So I'm just covering the three key services here. SharePoint goes, SharePoint goes direct, which is why I use it in most cases as my end-to-end -end connectivity check uh, endpoint, because it goes to your SharePoint farm direct. There's no messing around with that traffic. It doesn't route through localized services, etc. Outlook uses something called GeoDNS, which I'm going to cover later on. So it's, you're kind of trying to chase a moving endpoint to do checks against latency to this. So it's not recommended unless you're specifically looking at Outlook. And Skype for Business, tests should be run against the media relay. So the Skype team have excellent um, guidance online, the Skype for Business framework, where they talk about what the acceptable latency levels would be to the edge of your network, to Microsoft's network, um, from the client to the edge of your network. Um, so that should be used as a test method if you're looking at Skype for Business. But moving forward, I'm going to use SharePoint as the example. So there are three elements you need to be aware of in terms of latency. So internal, client to egress. So obviously, that's your network. It's something you're responsible for um, to get that traffic to that edge. Um, it can be often centralized, which is, is fine. We just need to look at whether that centralization is going to cause performance issues, whether we can get a better result by using a local proxy or somewhere on the other side of the country, for example. Um, so this is where a network assessment really helps to make sure we, we know what's our, our best options on, on around here. Um, you've got to look at whether the network segments are capable of handling all this extra Office 365 traffic. If you've currently got Exchange in a data center and all the traffic goes in and out there and your egress for Office 365 is also in that data center, then you shouldn't have too much of a shift in traffic. But if you're going to add Skype for um, OneDrive for Business, a better example, um, then you've got to make sure that that infrastructure can cope with that extra flow of traffic. I thought long and hard about trying to think of a generic figure for latency that would be acceptable. And it's really difficult. It depends on your environment. So I came up with 100 milliseconds. Ideally, it would be much, much less of that to get to your egress. Um, I tested mine from our office in the UK. We have proxies in Dublin. And I was there in eight milliseconds. That's a reasonable amount of time for me on a well-configured network. My proxy is relatively close to me, and I'm there very quickly. Um, just to give you an example, 100 milliseconds would probably get you from coast to coast in the US. So your second leg is egress to Microsoft's network edge. Now, this is really the important piece, and I'm going to show you how to monitor this later on in terms of routing. Your ISP, or if you manage your own network leg to that peer point, which some customers do, um, this, that's your responsibility there. But 90 odd percent cases I look at, it's an ISP carrying that traffic to the peer point. So in many countries, that should be um, peering at a location in that country or adjacent. So that list I showed you in blue earlier on of those points, not every country has a peer, an ex internet exchange where we peer, but the traffic still should get on our network pretty quickly, depending on where you are. So again, 
to give you a figure is quite difficult. It depends where you are, where your ISP connects to. But I think 100 milliseconds is reasonable. And again, um, it should really be a lot lower than that. And I'll show you what it looks like from this convention center in a second. Then the final piece is from that, when you've got to Microsoft's network, we manage that from end to end. You don't really need to worry about that piece. We 100% manage that. We monitor it. If we have issues, we bypass, we have failover links. Um, constantly 24 by 7 monitored. So generally, you don't require troubleshooting on that. The key point is to get to that network quickly. So in terms of an assessment, I like to put it together like this. That you've got a site. You look at, OK, it's taken me 10 milliseconds to get to my proxy in this case. Then from the proxy to Microsoft's network takes 30 milliseconds. Again, I'd be happy with that. And then from Microsoft's global network to my Office 365 endpoint, in this instance, it takes 10 milliseconds. The reason I've put an express route connection in there is because this is where an assessment is necessary to show, you know what, if I put an express route circuit in in my second location, does it make sense for me to use that for my client at site A? Because the latency to the egress at this point is 40 milliseconds. It takes 20 milliseconds to get from the edge of my network through to Microsoft Global Network and then through there another 10 milliseconds because we're connecting in the same place. So for this example, the express route connection would have higher latency. Now, in this example, the difference is relatively negligible. The 50 to 70 milliseconds, you wouldn't feel the difference between that generally. Um, if that were much higher, like 170 to the express route or via the express route circuit, then we really need to consider, is that the best way for me to connect for this site? And again, I'll give you an example of that a little later on. So again, to give you generic figures here, if you're in a Europe, European site, to get to an EMEA data center, you should be looking at around 100 milliseconds total. Um, I, I traced, well, I'll show you some traces in a second, but I traced from home, and it was about 30 odd milliseconds to Dublin to my data center from my home. So it should be much lower than that. Um, North America, Roughly 100 to 150 milliseconds max. Again, um, it should be much lower than that. APAC to EMEA is our longest route. And that, just as an example, that can be done in around 300 to 320 milliseconds. And our services, in the main, will work over that length of latency, um, with the exception of, like, uh, for example, exchange in online mode. It needs to be much lower than that. But um, generally, we'll cope with latency at that level. The system is designed to work connecting end-to-end. -end. It's a global service. So how do we measure that latency? Trace route's not a brilliant way of doing this because we don't prioritize ICMP on our network, and most network providers don't either, and it doesn't always get through the network. What I use as a tool of choice is a sysinternals tool um, called PSPing, which connects, you tell it an endpoint, be it a URL, IP address, and a TCP port, or a UDP port for that matter, and it will connect to that. So on a TCP level, it's going to send a SIM packet to where it's got to go, so uh, my SharePoint farm, tenantname.sharepoint.com, and it's going to measure how long that SIM packet takes to get back. The benefit of this is it's using the, the same path as your traffic would do, um, because we're going over the same TCP port, and it should connect because the firewall should be open to allow that traffic through. Um, there's a caveat here. If you've got a proxy, remember I said earlier that that proxy is going to connect on your behalf. So when you send a SIM packet, when you've got a proxy in the way, the proxy is going to respond to that SYNAX. So you're only able to me uh, measure as, as far as that, that proxy using PSPing. So with that, um, I'm going to do a quick demo to my tenant in, in EMEA using PSPing. So as I say, remember that. That PS ping is like a SIM packet. We send it to where it's got to go. It will connect on a TCP port that we tell it to, and we measure how long that takes to come back. And then we can tell PS ping to do that multiple times, um, and then look at the average of that. All right, I'm going to continue talking because my PC has gone to sleep. Um, so with that, you've got to consider how you're connecting to the service. So if you've got a proxy, you can still use PSPing, but we need to change the endpoint so that it's connecting to um, my proxy name on port 80 or 8080. So it's still a useful tool to measure that leg to your egress. 
Okay, we're back. Oh yeah, if anyone has customer calls with me, this is my stand-in, my son Jake for this week. He's probably delivering higher quality as well. <laughs> so, um, PS Pink, freely downloadable from Microsoft.com. So what I'm going to do is PS Ping to paulcole.sharepoint.com, which is my SharePoint site in Dublin over port 443 because I want that to go over SSL. Ah, one thing I forgot. So I'm going to tell it to do it 20 times. Because I want to see an average of how long that takes. This, these times should be very consistent. If they're fluctuating up and down heavily, there's something in the network causing that. Uh, essentially, it's jitter. But um, you can see here, it's pretty consistent. And it'll give me, when it's finished, an average of that latency. So there we go. The lowest time was 109 milliseconds, maximum being 112. So it's very consistent now. I've got a good network connection. And also the time. Consider where that's going. It's going from here in Atlanta to our data center in Dublin and back in 110 milliseconds. So I, I'm happy I've got excellent connectivity here, which we'll have a look at in a bit more uh, detail in a second when we look at the routing, because there's a reason why that's, that's very good. I'm not going over Microsoft's network here. This is from the convention center's network. So let's look at routing. How do we tell? if we're doing a good job of connecting to Microsoft's global network. Well, I asked a number of my colleagues to take trace routes from different locations around the globe. Um, so we can see how that differs from different locations. So this is my home in the UK. Um, and what we're looking for here is the point where we hit that Microsoft network, that msn.net. And we can often figure out where that is looking at the area of highlighted. So we've actually, this is a bit of a, a tricky one here, because we've actually hit Microsoft's network in hot seven there, 26 milliseconds. That IP address is one of BT's, but I believe that is sat on our network, um, as in the, the router to the, the next router is actually in the same place. Um, there's a, a reason why that shows up like that, but um, I haven't really got time to go into it. But the important thing is, I'm on Microsoft's network very quickly, and in hop eight, we can do, see two things. It's in London, which is the optimal place for me to peer from the UK. And if you look at the latency there, it's 35 milliseconds. But the end point where we've hit is 34 milliseconds. So why is that? It's because of the way our network's in, um, constructed. Once you're on our backbone network, you will not see latency increases as you go along the hops. You'll see the end-to-end -end latency of the end point we're going to bounce off. So 35 milliseconds is actually the... Uh, latency all the way to Dublin. But the key point is here, how quickly we're on Microsoft's network. The next one is from Paris, is a bit easier to read. We come off the ISP's network onto a, an edge router in Paris, PAR, uh, in eight milliseconds. So again, this ISP is doing an ex excellent job of getting that traffic to Microsoft's network in a reasonable location. This was taken in Paris, it appears in Paris. And then it's in our data center in Amsterdam in uh, 20 milliseconds. The reason I know it's Amsterdam is that last hop AMS. If it was Dublin, it'd be DB something. So again, I asked a colleague over here in Florida to do the same. And we can see we're on Microsoft's network, 24 milliseconds. Pretty happy with that. Uh, in Miami, which as the user was in Miami, that's uh, to be expected. You can actually see here this customer or this, this user, their ISP doesn't have direct peering with Microsoft. You can see it hopping between different ISPs networks. Because we don't, maybe don't peer with that ISP, they'll hand it to another ISP in that same area that does peer with Microsoft and they'll hand it to us. But the key thing is here, 24 milliseconds onto Microsoft's network, an end-to-end -end latency, this is to my tenant in Dublin, you see DB3 here, at the bottom on hot 20. Um, in 125 milliseconds, which again, excellent performance end to end. Now, I had to be careful with this last one. Um, this was taken from a customer site. I've sanitized everything and I've hidden the blushes of the ISP involved. Um, 
This is where this has gone wrong, because this customer was in Scotland. They should peer with Microsoft, or their ISP should, in London. That's the obvious place. And if you look in hop six and seven, or six even, they're in London. So you'd think the sensible thing to do there would be hand the traffic to Microsoft and let us deal with it from there. But this ISP, their only way they route to Microsoft's network, you can see in hop seven, is New York. So we've gone through London where they should hand it to us, and they think, okay, we'll take that to New York. So the ISP has to pay for this traversal, and they eventually hit Microsoft's network in hop 12 in New York, NYC, uh, in 87 milliseconds. Now you saw on my latency before, it was 24 milliseconds. This customer should be in their data center in Europe in 30 odd milliseconds, roughly. So we've already gone way over that, and we've only just hit Microsoft's network. And then we have to backhaul it across the Atlantic into London, which is LTS. It's a different London telecity. It's another peer point. And then we're into Amsterdam, finally, in 149 milliseconds. So this is the sort of thing we can find. If we find an ISP doing something silly like this, I said to the customer, just show them this trace route and say, um, can you do something about it? If not, contract, contact Microsoft, and our global network team will go and speak to that ISP. I'll give you a little anecdote. I think I'm doing right for time. Um, we, we did this in the UAE um, a year ago, where an ISP was routing traffic from the UAE and pairing with Microsoft's network in Singapore, which is a perfectly sensible decision if you don't understand how Microsoft's infrastructure is set up. Because there's big fat cables, which is probably the cheapest route for them to get the traffic out through to Singapore from, from the Gulf area. So the problem with that is most of our customers in the Middle East have European data center locations. Um, so we noticed this because if we connect to Singapore, peer with Microsoft, we've got to backhaul it around the globe into Europe from there, which is not a good thing. I think we were looking at 300 odd milliseconds. So our global network team called the ISP and said, hey, can we do something about this um, peer in Europe? And literally within a week, they'd switched that over to peer in Frank Frankfurt, and the latency went down to about 130 milliseconds, which meant for some very happy Xbox Live users and some Office 365 users as well. And just a good point, actually, with that anecdote, this network carries Azure traffic. All our first-party services, Office 365, Xbox Live, Hotmail, et cetera, et cetera. So what I wanted to show you is just a bit of localization here. Um, so I took a trace route from the network here just before. And luckily for the ISP involved, they're doing very well. So our ISP in this, um, uh, this convention center is obviously Comcast here. So what we're looking at, I traced to my endpoint in Dublin. So we're on Comcast network, Comcast network, and we peer in one millisecond, ATB is Atlanta. So Comcast are doing an, an outstanding job of getting that traffic to Microsoft, as you'd expect, because it's Atlanta to Atlanta. But it's peering in the right place. Once on our network, we go through Atlanta, Washington, New York, into London, and then out to Dublin in a 107 milliseconds. That's why my PS ping before was so good, because the ISP here are, are doing a fantastic job. And uh, this, the network here this week has been the best I've ever seen at a conference. The, whoever sets that up needs a round of applause. Not now, though. <laughs> <laughs> so a quick trace route, once you understand what you're looking at, can give you great information as to how your ISP is performing. And if you're in that example bracket that I showed before, where your ISP is bouncing the traffic around somewhere, then we, we may be able to do something about that. We just need to be aware that sometimes the ISPs might not appear in the perfect location for you, but they may do somewhere within reason. And they, they'll have reasons for that in terms of circuit cost, capacity, et cetera. So you can't complain. I don't know, if you're in, I'm trying to think of an example. If you're in LA and your ISP peers in San Francisco, that's, that's fine for me. Uh, what they shouldn't be doing is pairing with us in New York. That's the sort of thing you need to flag with them, or us. So the other thing to think about when you're looking at this is technology-induced delay. 
normally when I talk about this, I mean a wired Ethernet connection. If you then start talking over wireless, LTE, 3G, um, and I've worked with numerous customers using low Earth orbit satellites, you'd think that was just military, but you can think of mining customers where they have sites out in, in the outback or somewhere. And we talk about whether Office 365 will work over that. But again, if you've got an optimal connection from the edge of your network, so let's say I've got a mining company with a site in the middle of the outback in Australia, and they use a satellite to get that traffic up and down to their head office in Sydney. So previously, their exchange servers may have been in Sydney. So you've still got that delay. Um, the benefit of going to Office 365 is, as long as that connection from Sydney into the Australian data centers is optimal, you'll probably get better performance because you're moving away from Exchange 2010 and Outlook 2007 to a modern version of the service which has better protocols for handling high latency connections. So the point of this slide is just to think about when you're looking at this that the method that you're connecting can add additional latency on tap just by the pure functionality of that, um, that technology. So we'll look a little bit now about location decisions. I spoke before about where you put your proxies, etc. It's always worth looking from each site you have, where is the optimal place for you to connect to the network. Um, it might well be quick, easier, quicker, cheaper to put a local pipe in at an office than upgrade your, your WAN links to backhaul that to a centralized proxy location. So I came up with a, a relatively straightforward uh, example here. So this is a snapshot of our network in the US. Uh, I've put the router names are just airport codes, but that's generally what they are anyway. Um, so you can figure out where they are. So this is our network. And my customer has three sites in this country. One in, well, it looks like it's in Nevada, but San Francisco is where I meant. One in Michigan connecting through um, Chicago. The point is here, the yellow line indicates the internet egress. This would be an ideal setup for a customer that has these three sites. They have local breakouts, and they peer with Microsoft in San Francisco, in Chicago, and the one on the right is in the, Pacific, in the Atlantic for uh, tax reasons. Um, but they connect through JFK. The red line indicates that customer's MPLS, but we're not using it because we're punching that traffic out for Office 365 locally. And their tenant location is in the middle there in Des Moines at that point in time. So that is a pretty much perfect network architecture for that company with three sites. What I see a lot of at the minute is a customer thinking, right, I want Express Route. I'm going to stick it in my head office in Chicago. Um, and then we're going to route all Office 365 traffic over our MPLS and egress in Chicago. So in this instance, it, it's OK. It'll work. Um, but from San Francisco, you've got to use your MPLS to get, or your, I keep saying MPLS, but your, your managed network to get from San Francisco to uh, that Chicago office. Whereas before, you didn't have to do that. So can that network handle it? Is it going to perform as well as Microsoft's? Probably not. Um, so, but in this case, it might be OK. But what happens if that tenant location, not if, but when that tenant location moves, now it's in Quincy in, Seattle, in Washington. Now, that San Francisco site has to route traffic across the MPLS into Chicago here with Microsoft in Chicago, and then we have to backhaul it all the way across to where the data is in, in Washington, and then it has to come back again. Whereas before, when we had a local internet egress, we've got a network link from San Francisco to there, and you would have much, much lower latency, less chance of issues along that network, because that path's much shorter, and it's optimized. It's on Microsoft's network for the majority of that leg. So what's the solution? With this customer, I'd suggest that San Francisco site you shouldn't really be using express route to egress. You keep using your localized egress. New York, given the proximity there, it should be OK. Or we could put a second express route circuit in, in the west coast to handle that traffic. So I'm going to talk about bandwidth planning now a little bit. As I say, a little bit, because there's a whole session on this tomorrow. Um, and they'll go into great detail on the, their experience around this. So it's a really tricky area. I get asked this a lot. How much bandwidth do I need for Office 365? And you'll usually be met with a shrug. 
I don't know the answer. There, there isn't an easy one. Um, it really depends on what you're doing, how your users are using the service, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a small customer, we have online calculators for most services, so just use those. They, they'll give you a pretty accurate view. However, for most of you, if you're enterprise size, then the calculators are only as good as the data you put into them. And to get good data, you need to look at your pilot users and put that data into those calculators to figure out what you need. Monitor the traffic going in and out from your pilot users over the course of a, a week, a month, and then extrapolate that data out. Um, how would you baseline that traffic? You can ask your network team to monitor that. You can run localized network captures on a client to see how much data goes in and out to Microsoft's endpoints. Uh, if you're moving from on-premises exchange to the cloud, your network team should be able to tell you how much traffic goes in and out of that exchange farm, and that shouldn't really change once you shift to the cloud. The, the big kicker is always OneDrive for Business. You give a user a OneDrive for Business folder, they're going to put everything they've got in there, not use it at all. Who knows until you look at your pilot users and figure out what they're doing, or obviously what you're going to tell them to do. So I'll skim over that. As I say, there's a whole session on that tomorrow, and they'll give you great uh, advice on uh, the, the detail of how to do that. So moving on, I've talked about the bottlenecks you might run into in terms of connectivity to our network, um, how to measure latency into that network. But I wanted to cover at least a few of the common performance issues that are caused by devices at the egress uh, or some other config problem. This is one of my favorites, because when I find it, I'm hero of the hour for the day. So I would hazard a guess. I think I, when I did network assessments, I reckon somewhere around 40 to 50% of the customers I did an assessment on would run into this issue. Uh, Jonathan down here does them a lot, roughly all. Yep. So there's a good chance that 40% of you in this room can go back to the office and find this problem, and you'll, well, you'll hopefully get a raise for it. And it's very easy to spot once you know what you're looking for, and it's very easy to fix. So TCP window scaling. This is a setting to, how do I, okay, let's step back a second. When we connect a TCP session, we agree a buffer size, uh, how much data I can send to you without you acknowledging that you've got that data. So the maximum value of that buffer is 64K. So I can only send you 64K of data. If you've not acknowledged any of that traffic has arrived, I'll stop and wait, because I've filled your buffer. Now, on modern networks, 64K can be pushed on a network in a split millisecond. So window scaling is a method to multiply that 64K to give us a bigger buffer. The theoretical maximum is one gig. Um, you shouldn't ever see that. That would be ridiculous to put a gig of data on a network without an acknowledgement. So Windows manages this, and any other um, network infrastructure manages this themselves. So if you're using Lynx, they'll have the same kind of different kind of management levels, but they'll, they'll grow and shrink that window to optimize the bandwidth through that network. So what happens is, here I've got a client in Japan connecting to Office 365 in the US. With Windows scaling off, I can have a massive pipe of bandwidth to send that traffic down. But because it takes 100 odd, 150 milliseconds to get across to the US, I can send that data in a, a split millisecond. But that data has got to get to the US, and the server has got to receive it and send a response back going, yeah, I've got it. So what's happening is the client's going to burst 64K and wait. Get the acknowledgment, burst another 64K, wait. And obviously, when you're moving large amounts of data, that's really going to add up. So window scaling allows us to have a buffer that's big enough that, well, I've not finished my slide. So now the acts have come back. In this case, then we can end up sending the data. So what we want is a much bigger buffer. So I can literally throw my data down this one gig pipe I'm paying for and not care about the acknowledgments too much, because I know you've got a buffer enough to handle that data and eventually those acts will come back and that buffer never fills, so we can fill the network pipe with that data. So what's the impact of having this disabled? Now I did the math on this. This is not kind of roundabout figures. These are mathematical maximums. Without window scaling enabled, your maximum throughput on 
let's call that 100 milliseconds. So from me to my server in the UK. Um, I could pay for a 10 gig pipe. The maximum throughput I'm ever going to get is five megabits per second. I, I can't tell you the amount of times where we've figured this out when I've been on site and we've said to a customer, there's your problem. And we flick that setting on. I'll explain a little later where you might find it. Um, and suddenly, phew, the customer's been throwing money at this network circuit to try and improve performance. And it's been one setting on a proxy at the edge of that network that is just throttling that network throughput. So that 100 millisecond latency, I could theoretically fill that one, uh, 1,000 megabits per second link uh, with window scaling enabled. That's as much of a difference. If you look at the bottom, there's a one millisecond latency. So that's the equivalent of a, a server and a machine in the same building, or you know, a couple of rooms away or something. So you could have very high performance servers connected by multi-gig networks. You can't utilize that network. Uh, with this disabled. You'll get 500 megabits per second through it at max. So even at very low latencies, this problem is still there. So just to give you some examples of how this works, actually, while I'm talking, I'm just going to fire up so my VPN had uh, kicked off. Um, this is an example of a customer I looked at in Australia connecting to an EMEA data center. So there's very high latency here, around 300 milliseconds. But we were downloading a 14 meg PDF from, a, from EMEA to that tenant from SharePoint. Now, with that original setting, it took 500 seconds, 507 seconds. That is unusable. To a user, would you put up with that? No, you wouldn't. So we found the proxy had disabled the setting and wasn't optimally configured for TCP sessions. So we flicked that setting on, and the same file took 21 seconds. So that's the difference between unusable and perfectly fine use. So you might think, well, there could be a million things going on there. When you did the first test, there was a network issue, yada, yada. So I did a test on Microsoft's CorpNet on a Windows server where I just turned off Windows scaling. So this is the same box, same network. Everything's the same. It's the same machine. I used NetSH to disable Windows scaling, and it took 111 milliseconds to move a 30 meg file at 200 millisecond latency. Turn that setting back on, 12 milliseconds, for the, uh, 12 seconds, sorry, for the same file. That's the difference. And if you still don't believe me, then we've got trust issues, but I hopefully have a lab to show you. So I have two servers in the UK, which hopefully I'm going to connect to relatively quickly. They, uh, they dropped when my machine went to sleep. So what I'm going to do, this I tested before. We use these for labs. So given the distance, they've got 100 odd millisecond latency. But um, we use them for labs. So there's artificial latency on the machine. I measured it before. It's about 300 milliseconds. So this is the equivalent of Australia to EMEA on our network. Uh, maybe a bit touch higher. But So what I'm going to do once I get the folder open is drop a 30 meg file into the service. So these are two servers sat next to each other on the same network, same hardware, same spec. One, this one on the right, has Windows scaling off. I just use NetSH to disable it on the client. This one on the left has it enabled as normal. So I'm going to give this one a head start. Hopefully my uh, file was still in there. No, let me get it. And I'm going to drop it in the other one. And you'll see the difference here. So as I say, Windows is going to work out what's the best throughput here. So on the one with Windows scaling on, you'll see the kind of fluctuations. But it will find a kind of peak performance level. But you can already see the difference here. That is one setting that I've disabled using NetSH. Now, it's normally not Windows that causes this problem when I see it. It's normally a device at the egress of your network that could very, invariably it's going to be a proxy. Um, but it could be a firewall, any other device that can mess with that network traffic. Um, there we go. So that's just a 30 meg file. I'll leave that going while I'm talking to give you an idea of how, what the difference is. So that has maxed out that throughput there on this server because I've disabled window scaling. So you imagine the difference here when your users are syncing their mailboxes, syncing their OneDrive folders, or you're doing mailbox migrations. It's enormous. 
and it's one setting. So uh, I have a blog post which is linked at the end, which will walk you through how to check for this. A very simple network capture will show you. Um, I have a slide in a second. But I'm going to move away from my machine here. You, you get the idea. That's a 30 meg file, and it's probably still going to go for another 30 seconds or so. So what do you look for? The, this information is negotiated in the three-way handshake, the TCP handshake. So you're just looking for that SYN and SYNAC on that TCP session. Again, my TechNet blog will walk you through this. But you look for that scale factor. As long as it's non-zero, uh, you can see the bottom one there coming back from uh, Office 365 is set to scale factor not supported, which means scale factor is not going to be used on this TCP session. So I know Office 365, in every form, aside from currently CRM has this disabled. Um, we, there's some issue with the load balancers in front of them, which we're working on. But if you're connecting to uh, SharePoint, uh, OneDrive for Business, Exchange, Skype for Business, this is enabled on our side. So if you see a Synac packet coming back from Microsoft with that disabled like that, or a zero value, it's a device in between the two which is disabling it, which I say is very likely to be your proxy or a device at the network address. So it's pretty easy to fix or to find with a quick network capture, flag it, fix it. There's no reason not to have this on on modern networks. Back in the day when it first was implemented, some routing equipment didn't understand what this was and dropped the packets and caused problems. But if that's the case, that device needs updating or going in the trash. No questions. So another common performance issue I see, and I, I dealt with this last week with a customer, we use GeoDNS to connect your Outlook client to the local CAS server. So what that means is if my tenant is North America, and that young lady with the fetching pink hat is uh, in North America, or it could represent your office in North, anywhere in North America, what she's going to do is open Outlook and connect to outlook.office365.com. So we'll do a DNS lookup for that. We know, we've got multiple ways of knowing where that DNS call is, uh, is performed from. So we know you're in the US. And correspondingly, we send you a list of CAS server IP addresses in our data centers in North America. So that could be in any data center. It doesn't matter where your mailbox is. You'll hit a CAS server in a data center in North America. And then we'll backhaul your traffic from uh, wherever it resides. So, good. What happens if that user goes on vacation to Europe, wants to check her email or on business, or that could be your office in Europe? Again, because that DNS call is now completed in Europe, we know you're in Europe, and you're going to hit a CAS server in the European region. So that might be Amsterdam, Dublin, Helsinki, or Vienna. You'll hit a CAS server in one of those, so that connection point to the edge of our services, not the network, is quite short. So we, that CAS server can do its business very quickly with you um, without having to traverse all the way to where your mailbox is. And we'll make a connection from that CAS server over our network back to where your mailbox is. So we're not moving your mailbox or anything here. We're just connecting Outlook to a CAS server in the region where that user is. Sounds excellent. We, we do this globally. But there is an issue here. If that internet egress point where we do that DNS lookup is not in the region where my user is, we're going to have an issue. So if we take this, ish, this example, the user is in North America, my tenant's North American, but for whatever reason, my DNS server is in our European office. So my DNS call is going to go across to Europe, say, Outlook the Office 365, please. And because we think you're in Europe, which technically that DNS call was, we'll give you a list of CAS servers in the European region. So when that client connects, it's going to connect to, in this case, Dublin, which has got to backhaul the data across the Atlantic twice, unnecessarily. So the key thing here is to make sure that that DNS call is performed in region and where your internet egress is. So I had a customer the other week doing this with ExpressRoute, where they tried to use ExpressRoute in the US for their APAC traffic. So their DNS call was completing as we'd like it to in APAC. But because their network egress was in the US, we're going to have to go across to the US, 
out of their express route circuit and then connect to a CAD server back in APAC where that user was originally, which is very suboptimal. So I'm going to show you a quick demo of how that works, what to look for. Again, I've got a blog post which walks you through this very clearly. So all we need to do here is ping outlook.office365.com. Um, and then this is what I'm interested in. I'm in North America. The, the central bit doesn't really matter. Um, we do try and get you to a cache server in the kind of area where you are in the US. But the important piece is I'm in North America, and that response says NAM central. Um, so with that, I'm going to connect to a CAS server in North America. So that matches. If I were to um, move to back to Europe, that response would say something like European. How much time have I got? OK, unplanned demo is always the best thing to do. I'm going to change our, uh, my endpoint on our VPN and get it to disconnect. No. Thanks, MSIT. I tell you what, I may have already got. This is why you shouldn't do unplanned demos. Let's see if I've got that data. No. <laughs> okay. Well. What I was going to show you, if MSIT's VPN client would disconnect when I asked it to, would be I was going to change the endpoint so it completes that DNS call over in um, Europe, so into our Reading office. And you'll see, as soon as I do that DNS lockup again, it will say the same call. It will say EMEA something, which means that that DNS call has resolved over there. And that's what I want. So when you go back to the office, ping outlook.office365.com and see what you get back. If you're in North America, it should say NAM something. If you say, um, if you're in Europe, then it should say uh, Europe something. If those two things don't add up, then you've got an issue. Normally what that issue is, is either your DNS server is outside of the region where you are, or your internet egress is outside of the region where you are. Or occasionally it can be, let's say I have four DNS servers in Round Robin. One of those for failover reasons is not in region. So we can use a conditional forward to make sure that that, um, that call is, is sent out of a, a, a localized DNS server. Uh, very rarely could it be that our database, I, I've only dealt with this a handful of times, where our database, for some reason, thinks your IP range is in a different region. If that is the case, let us know through support, and we can fix that very quickly for you. So there are other things just to look out for. I always make this analogy when I speak about performance. Um, the, the British Olympic cycling team have a, um, a, a team called the Marginal Gains Team. And their job is to look at, if I change the angle of the handlebars, it saves us 100 milliseconds per lap. And if I change the metal in the bearings, it, change, it shaves off 500 milliseconds per lap. Which on their own, you look at these things and you think, yeah, who cares? But when you start to add them up, it can be the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal. And I like to think of the same thing when I'm looking at Office 365 connectivity. DNS lookups. If that takes two seconds, your users are going to click on something. It takes two seconds before we've even started to connect. Proxy authentication. All these things are on my blog, by the way. You can walk through them. Again, that sometimes can take two seconds. It's unnecessary. But that's four seconds before I've even hit Office 365. And this is the difference between your on-premises server and the performance of it and the cloud. Just because we're going through a different network path and different equipment to get out, if we've not optimized those, then it can be a performance hit that makes it seem slower than your on-premises solution. And the end goal with this is that the cloud solutions are providing a service at the same performance level as your on-premises solutions. So all our technical guidance is listed on that aka.ms forward slash tune around performance planning, bandwidth planning, et cetera. Um, so my blog post is li uh, linked off there. And uh, there's some links on the next slide to show you. But just to summarize, and then we have five minutes for questions. Um, 
If you're onboarding or going for new services, I'd really encourage a network assessment. I mean, either yourself, we offer them from Premier Services, MCS, to check that your connectivity is as optimal as possible. Evaluate your network egresses to make sure the, the most optimal one is used. Avoid proxies if you can, and scale those services up at the edge. Those common performance bottlenecks um, so my blog post has a top 10 issues. I can count on one hand out of over 100 customers where I've hit none of those issues. So worth looking at. Bandwidth planning is always worth doing in advance given the time it takes. Um, and express route, we'll talk about tomorrow, that that's not a silver bullet for any network performance issues. There are the links. So this, record, this should be available online pretty much after this session. Those are the links that I've been talking about today. My blog post being at the bottom. At the top is the session that's on tomorrow about bandwidth, if you're interested in that. And with that, I'm nothing not, if not efficient. We have five minutes left for questions, and I believe this young lady over here had one. Or have I answered it already? Can you use the microphone, please, because we're recording the session. Thank you. Made it easier for me, have you? OK, so we had uh, Microsoft come and do a um, network assessment. It was a one-week assessment. And they practically did pretty much exactly what you showed us, right? Yep. And they found some TCP scaling issues for us. Yep. So the question which our network team is asking us is to say to ensure that we have the bandwidth available. So we are only focusing on, in January, to move to Exchange Online. All our mailboxes, about uh, 4,000 of them. Do you see a need for a four-week deep dive network assessment? I can't answer that without looking at the stuff that came out of that report. Okay, I've so I think what they're only looking at to say is, like you said, for one drive, right? You need to plan for what the bandwidth should be. Yes. And you said the standard Excel calculators and spreadsheets are only sufficient for 25 plus users. Absolutely. And then, so this is about bandwidth planning rather yes, than. Yes, only bandwidth planning. Uh, yes. A, a go to Ed session tomorrow, that, and yep. he'll talk you through the complexities of this and the things you need to look out for. Because it's not, this, this is why those calculators are quite difficult. Because you, they're, as I say, they're only good as the data you put in them. Yep. And yep. that data has to come from you looking at your pilot. So uh, save that question for Ed tomorrow in his okay. session, and he'll give you a better answer yep. as well. I'll be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Uh, over here. Uh, let's say that you have a uh, company which is uh, spread globally, yep. and you have tenant which is located in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, for exchange connectivity, there is no problem because exchange work in that way that you will be connected to closest CAS server and then proxy through Microsoft Backbone. But uh, can you tell me uh, what to do with uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, which uh, is on the same platform, but it is not working. Uh, architecture of that service is not the same as uh, Exchange. How will Australian users connect to tenant uh, on okay. a um, good way, which is located in Europe? For, okay. I'm talking about SharePoint and OneDrive. Sure. So Australia to Europe, as I said, is our longest route. So this is where our friends at Riverbed down in the expo might be able to offer you a solution that would assist in that area because we've got very high latency there. I mean, I've worked with many, many customers who are using SharePoint quite happily from Australia into Europe. But it depends what you're doing, how heavy your data you're moving in and out. There's just pure physics there. We're working on kind of constantly working on solutions to bring data closer to customers. So in future, we may have something to offer around there. But um, in that instance, if the performance, you've checked all the network connectivity and it's as optimal as you're going to get it, all the stuff we just talked about, and it's still not performing at the level you want from Australia, then SharePoint is one use case where one optimizers can help you. And if you speak to someone like Riverbed or the other vendors downstairs, they'll be able to give you an idea about what level they can provide on that. That's one of the use cases I see for uh, one optimizers is high latency, heavy page load, thing like that, because they can cache data and deliver it quicker, et cetera. Um, but the service is designed to work over our longest latencies. It's just when you have very heavy, customized um, SharePoint sites that have a lot of data to pull in, we're just bound by physics because of where the data is in the client. Is. OK? Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Uh, one more. Thanks. Uh, you may have already said this, but uh, when you talked about the TCP scaling, is there any reason that it's not just set on by default? I mean, it didn't seem like there was a reason that you wouldn't yeah. just. Um, I, I probably didn't clear that part. I was trying to finish on time. Um, so Windows scaling should be on absolutely by default. Windows has been enab enabling this by default since 
uh, well, it, it was in 2003, but it's been on by default for, for everything by, from Vista onwards. Your networking equipment may be old or be configured from years ago where that maybe was an issue and they disabled it. Oh, I think that's telling me to shut up. Um, and um, so that, um, I forgot that's where I was then. So yes, your proxy or your firewall at the edge of your network may be disabling it because that's how it was configured years ago when it was put in. It, it should not be turned off on modern networks. You cannot fully utilize the bandwidth without them. If you find a piece of rec on the internet, there is no piece of equipment that does not understand window scaling because it would have been spotted by now and removed at the occasion. And it's very unlikely the equipment in your environment cannot handle window scaling. Um, so your client to server traffic within your environment will absolutely have window scaling enabled. So if your proxy is disabling it, just turn it on. Um, and it, it should, again, speak to the vendor always. Um, they may have a specific reason why they've disabled it. And if they don't have a good answer, speak to another vendor would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. Okay, any more? No, good. Thank you very much.